The 80s had the general. The 90s had John Gilligan. In the noughties, it was the reign of Martin Marlowe Highland. His was a familiar path with success and power and then the recklessness. He had to go because with him, an innocent young man doing an honest day's work died. Crime World presents Caught in the Crossfire, the unsolved murders of coke kingpin Marlowe Highland and innocent Anthony Campbell. Available now on all podcast platforms. So now, if we were talking about Michael Chino Ryan being murdered maybe 15 or so years ago or longer, um, it would be unlikely we'd be referring to it in a scenario of a, some sort of a brawl, you know, a, maybe a, a drunken brawl or something. It would be far more likely that he may have been a victim of a gangland feud. But actually, he seems to be sort of uh, a criminal who worked amidst various gangs. And in particular, he would have been working with the Aim and the Don Dunn gang in his day. Yeah, I think um, he was part, he was one of the men charged with what, which at the time was one of the most significant uh, investigations going on for Gardaí, if not the most significant in the capital. Um, Eamon the Don Dunn um, and along with the two Bradley brothers were charged in connection with a cash van robbery attempt, basically. Mm. And at the time Eamon Dunn, this is in 2007, he had no convictions. Um, he wasn't facing any criminal peril, really. And he was really operating at the sort of peak of his, of, his, of his powers and he was linked to, I think it was 16 murders at one stage. So this this investigation was seen as a sort of mark in the sand that was going to potentially take out the most dangerous criminal gang operating in the city. One of the co-accused was a guy called Michael Chino Ryan. Um, he, the Bradley brothers, for anyone who doesn't know, is Alan Fatpus Bradley and Wayne Bradley. And they would have been key members of the the Marlow Highland Stroke, uh, Eamon the Don Dunn organisation. Yeah, I mean, they they probably were famous for a number of reasons. One of them involved the libel case taken against um, the, Star on, the Star on Sunday, the Irish Star on Sunday. Um, I didn't know about that. What happened? They, well, it went all the way to the High Court and uh, Alan Bradley had said he was... Um, linked to an article where he wasn't named, but he, they were described as the Fathead Brothers and that this had libeled them because it connected them with a number of armed robberies. Um, and ultimately they lost that case. Uh, and that was a sort of, it, it got a lot of publicity, but it made them, I suppose, famous. Um, They've no convictions in relation to drugs offences. No, they? I mean, certainly we have... Um, they have. They haven't. Obviously, Eamon Dunn was operating a drug gang. Yeah, and um, that was the, you know, the primary business of 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 his organisation. But no, and, and two thousand and seven, a lot of those robberies that would have been headed up, led up by Marlow Highland, or had Eamon the Don Dunn. No, I think to power. Yeah, Eamon the Don Dunn had come into power. Yeah. I mean, there was there was obviously the the peak of those armed robberies that were targeting these cash and transit vans that occurred probably at the sort of started the turn of the century and um, the the Bradley brothers were were linked to these crimes yeah they they have certainly people have made contact bef before to the Sunday world offices to insist that they weren't involved in the drugs trade but you know the, So I this, think what was happening was those armed robberies under Marlowe and probably under Eamon the Don Dunn the funds from them certainly the the funds that Marlowe would have collected, the funds that Eamon, the Don Dunn would have collected were being pumped into purchasing drugs uh, and they were then being sold for additional profits. They were. And I suppose when you get to 2007, there's that boom time for those cash and transit raids that had kind of come, started to come to an end or had come to an end because there had been a, a period where a lot of them had been very successful the policing of them hadn't really caught up. The banking systems put in place hadn't caught up with them. Um, by it, but at this stage, uh, they certainly were. Um, Michael Chino Ryan, I think there was seven co-accused charged in that case. Um, inevitably, with these with these crimes, there's a certain amount of soldiers and there's a certain amount of of loot of generals, yeah. I suppose. Um, Eamon the Don the Don Don who ultimately died before the case could come to court. Um, he was spotted in a kind of a convoy sitting away from 
the actual attempted robbery or what was going to be the attempted robbery. So there was a number of soldiers, I suppose, brought in to, 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 who were planned to do the actual job. So what happened? It was a really famous, you know, robbery gone wrong, of course. Yeah, the attempted robbery occurred on the 2nd of November 2007. There was a convoy of four cars uh, headed towards the uh, the Chubb offices in Sandyford and they waited for a van to start its run at 8am. There was an inside man in in as part of the operation, a guy called Daryl Caffrey, who was ultimately convicted as well. He was a passenger in the vehicle at the time. Um, when the van stopped at, at Selbridge, shopping centre. Caffrey and the, the, the other chub worker got out, went out to fill an ATM. And at that point, a guy called Joseph Warren, who was ultimately convicted in connection with the crime as well, approached the van with a, with a saw while Ryan tried and failed to open the front doors. And he had already got keys, which the evidence was heard that they... Um, that There's Adam, a huge amount of money involved at stake here. Yeah, I mean, you're talking... At that, a million, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was in or around that figure. And there'd been a number of these raids on, on cash and transit vans that had all, you know, over a period of five years, really, where, you know, millions were being gotten. I mean, that doesn't exist now at this point. Obviously, mm. there's still ATM machines being filled around the country, but that whole trade changed and ultimately they were there was these escorts were being put in place a lot more a lot stronger. There was further systems, you see those the inking of the the notes and all of that, you know, various measures that were ultimately successful. So this is coming at kind of the end of this this boom time. And like these robberies were described in detail by Joey O'Callaghan in yeah. The Witness. And he talked about how Brian Kenny, who had groomed him into the into the drug business, had sort of reached out to Marlow Highland through the Bradley brothers, got a meeting with him, and he had what something was very valuable, which was a shed, a big shed at the back of his yeah. property out near the airport. And they needed somewhere to go after they'd carried out these robberies. And sometimes they came in, you know, in the transit van yeah. that they'd robbed. They, um, this grouping that was under Marlow Highland that Joey describes. And, you know, he talked about how they planned it with efficiency. You had to move very, very quickly on these vans. They were monitoring um, the times they were coming to certain banks or, or ATM machines. They were carrying out quite a lot of reconnaissance. They were in place and they would move in on the security personnel very quickly and with firearms. Yes. And also there was, in a number of the cases, there was always suspected, which there was in this case, an inside man mm. who was providing them with information. It's actually interesting that you you said there to me that you were watching Love Hate again. I yeah. can't remember what season it's in, Yeah, but Nige is involved in, a, in an armed robbery of a cash and transit van. Yeah. I think it's in season four or five. And I was always told it was based on this, this heist. And he, in that, you see, they become, this opportunity becomes available, even though the gang or certainly some members of the gang are primarily involved in drugs, but there's always a liquidity issue. Mm. And people did get away with millions. And that can, as you said, that can, in, it can solve a lot of problems yeah, with that they quick need, they and easy money. to pay for the drugs. And I mean, they're going to multiply it by a lot if they turn that cash into drugs and get them sold. You know yeah. what I mean? They're going to multiply their profits by 10, 20, whatever the figure is, maybe. Um, of course, I'm, I've am i no doubt Eamon the Don Dunn at the time of this robbery had stepped into Marlowe's shoes in every which way. And Marlowe, of course, got a cut of everything that was stolen, whether he was on the job or not. Yeah. He got the biggest cut. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I've no doubt that, uh, you know, this was the plan for, for the Don in this case, had they not been yeah, I mean, like at that stage, there, there, there was become this, that pressure that had come on Marlowe Highland had now started to come on Eamon Dunn as well. Uh, he had become just the focus of, of Garda attention. Um, and he had some of his key figures around him in, on, on, on that day. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a, so Michael Gino Ryan, has been described. Yeah, we went off on a bit of a tangent We did. There. I was trying did. to remember what we'd started to talk about. And of course, it is this stabbing in Finglas when Michael Chino Ryan was stabbed, we believe, once and died. Yeah, he died. Um, injuries. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, when you hear a, a figure that's been involved in a high-profile gangland case, there's instantly, 
you know, and instantly, I suppose, a suspicion that 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 is what has had uh, led to him being targeted. But I think Michael Chino Ryan, in fairness, had not become, had not remained involved in sort of high level gangland crime for sure since his release from prison. We actually did a couple of stories uh, about him while he was in prison. Mm. Um, he was stabbed on one occasion. Um, or, you know, knifed or whatever, attacked in prison and he ultimately sued the state and I think he got 36,000 or something along those lines. But we also did a, a story, I remember in 2012, where he was brought to, was it a climbing wall, uh, brought to the Lilliput one Adventure Centre, I think, from Mount Joy, uh, Mount Joy's training unit at right. the time, a kind of an open prison and they were bringing prisoners out. Days you out know. to try and rehabilitate them back. I suppose, society, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, so, but obviously what, what seems to have happened in this case is nothing more complex than a than a drunken row yeah. um, that there's no particular build-up there's some sort of row. One person has been arrested. He's in his 30s. That person would have seemed to have had known Michael Ryan in advance and a fight broke out yeah. and somebody has lost their lives. And Michael Ryan's probably a long time since he was handy to, yeah. to gangs to go out on cash and transit robberies or whatever else he was doing, hiring himself out yeah. to groupings. I'm sure, you know, he's he died at 51 years of age, but his heyday is long gone. Yeah. I mean, they need, obviously the, in those sort of operations, you do need people mm -hmm. to do the grunt work. And often when you're talking, obviously the plan, if something like that, it's a million euro robbery, but it wouldn't be divided out each. Evenly, no. to say the least, there'd be somebody getting very much a, yeah. a sort of a, the the criminal equivalent of the minimum wage payment for five for you, one for well, me kind some, of thing. something yeah. like that. Um, um, what of the Bradley brothers? I mean, they have been quiet, really. I think 2015, Wayne Bradley was released from jail, and he was supposed to be under surveillance at that point. I know um, he certainly told people around him that he's given up a life of crime, and yeah, I mean, in he fairness, certainly hasn't come on the radar. No, he, he hasn't come on the radar. You know, there's always they haven't come on the radar. No. In fairness, um, they they may have been seen associating with other criminals. Of course, that doesn't mean they're involved in criminal conspiracies or plots. People mm. people obviously know each other, and there does seem to be a certain amount of connections that remain. Obviously, uh, Wayne Bradley hit the headlines again because of his involvement in some of the uh, anti-immigration protests. Mm. Um, but. I don't think anybody would suggest they're heavily involved in any sort of gangland crime in, in the Fingless area. They've retired. They they there's another generation that are that are involved in, in, in that feuding and in that drugs trade. And these are, I suppose, uh, elder statesmen who, who Yeah, I mean it's interesting. I wonder, like, you know, when it comes to the armed robberies of the ATM, robberies are pretty much well, I mean, I can't think of... I a, can't think of one either. And I, I actually don't know. Do you know, funny enough, even sometimes when you go to an ATM machine, you can't get cash out yeah, at the yeah. end of the weekend. It's like as if they're not putting quite as much in. We're not using as well, much cash. I mean, they, we certainly aren't a, you know, as a society. We're just not. No. Um, but clearly there's other activities. I mean, there's an awful lot of extortion going on. There's a lot of uh, drug debt collection and threats Um going on. We just saw a case this week. There was a young guy who had, you know, threatened and intimidated over 30,000 from a former school friend. Um, that's kind of the way they're pulling in the money. You see, you have to start somewhere. You need yeah. to pay for the drugs you're buying to go out and sell them. Well, if you look at back, like in, in the, the history of organised crime in Ireland, like from the 80s, there was a wave of bank robberies for nearly 10 years. Mm. And then there was a wave of tiger kidnappings, which was, you know, where obviously people that worked in banks or other financial institutions, they'd be, they'd be kidnapped and held mm. until money was hand over, handed over. Then there was the cash and transit raids. Now, that sort of heavy armed robbery mm. is really... It doesn't seem to be quite as frequent anyway. No. Now, however, there is constant low-level armed robberies, mm. people running into shops and, and holding up a, a weapon and getting mm. four or five hundred quid. But that kind of uh, complex armed raids are really at a minimum. Mm. Now, you still see them across Europe sometimes involving jewellery. Um, like that, that has still seems to exist. I suppose for the obvious reason that that you can get uh, something that's worth a lot of money. But those older guys, like you know, yeah. we're calling them elder yeah. statesmen at yeah. fifty. Well, but and they kind of are in in gangland terms. But they must have got a thrill out of it as well as 
everything else. I mean, that thrill of the, you know, the pounds, the moment, the money, the cash, the run, you know, the chase. Yeah. I mean, um, huge, huge money. And of course, you have to remember that as well as we're talking about the the history of organised crime, there was also a huge tradition within of, of you know, the sort of Robin Hood mentality mm. that whatever selling drugs was bad or preying on a, in a community or robbing homes in a community, but robbing banks was seen as, you know, a step up to yeah. say the least that it was, you know, you were taking from a, a faceless institution and that people in Ireland or certainly in parts of Ireland or some parts, some people in some parts of Ireland did not feel ill disposed towards bank robbers. Mm. I mean, that is just the mm -hmm. way it is. Um, and, you know, it's not just in Ireland. It just listened to a podcast on Ned Kelly, who was obviously his father or his mother was Irish, but that was in Australia as well. Yeah. And he was robbing banks. And Where he are you was finding a podcast by Ned Kelly? The Real Bandits, it's called, okay. I think. But it's good. But so, you know, this there is there was a tradition in Ireland, in, certainly in Dublin, over a good number of decades where bank robbers were viewed as a higher type of criminal mm -hmm. because they didn't prey in the community. They didn't prey on people who couldn't afford it. They preyed on institutions. Now, also, if you look back on the history of of armed robberies in Ireland, high level armed robberies, there was a lot of uh, people who were killed ultimately. Yeah, I was in going to say a lot of fatalities. A lot of fatalities and also yeah. a lot of people left traumatised yeah. and left deeply affected. So that's not to minimise it, but there, there was a sense of these armed robbers, they were a higher quality of criminal mm -hmm. and maybe the Bradleys fit into that category mm -hmm. um, as elder statesmen. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. But yet another one of their former, uh, whatever we'll call him, a colleague or... Yeah, well, a criminal associate, a criminal I think associate we have to say. Yeah. Has, uh, has met their end yeah. in uh, a, uh, you know, this time with a knife as opposed to looking down the barrel of a gun. But yeah, and exactly. And, you know, it's probably only achieved a certain amount of publicity I suppose you could say because of his background but the fact is these things people are dying from these things every day and it actually comes in the back on the same day that uh, Helen McEntee um, announced further that sanctions for knife crimes will be doubled in many cases so knife crime is an issue and it is something that the, that the Justice Minister is actually directed on now there's going to be new laws brought in that will basically double the maximum sentence for nearly all of those knife crimes because it is an issue it's an issue that gets big publicity in in the UK for some reason but it has maybe done for years yeah. yeah I mean I think it was about 20 years ago when it blew up there yeah. in yeah. the UK and it was kind of youths on the estates yeah knife crime became a massive problem but obviously uh, it is here too well look we'll leave it at that thank you very much thanks Nicola I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.